Hello, so the next module in the Modular Month kind of Cosmo Fingermajiggy is this. It is the, uh, basically, it's a, yeah, a MIDI to CV module. It's pretty, pretty big and it's based on the MIDI Muso chip, which is, uh, well, the MIDI Muso CV12, which is a chip that uh, is available from MIDI Muso that comes as a kit as well uh, for a MIDI to CV module. So this is basically a version that is sort of optimized for the Cosmo kind of format. And it's got, yeah, it's basically a big old chunk of a uh, big old chunk of uh, a wad of electronics basically and we'll build it in a little bit but if you look around the back it's just a couple of things to take note if you ever look at building this is you'll notice that there's two wires going from the midi cable uh, the blue wire goes to the one at the top so these are facing this way the blue wire goes to the top the pink wire goes to the bottom it doesn't matter what color it is but then so that one goes to this side and then that one goes to that side. That's the only bit that isn't like super um, obvious, but the rest of it's pretty self-explanatory to make, and it's a, it's quite an easy and quick build, surprisingly. So what this module can do is a fair few different modes of like a CV, MIDI to CV modes. It can be like a very in-depth single MIDI to CV with extra CC commands and stuff, which you can send different voltages over as well. It can also be a four channel mono CV module and you still get CC commands here CC74, CC71, CC1 you've got pitch bend you've got various the velocity you've got four velocities four gates and four MIDI CVs as well as a clock uh, output but then also there's another mode which has got less functions and it becomes a six channel MIDI to CV literally just uh, six CVs and six gates and then the rest of them are just the same but on uh, MIDI channel one and then you can also have it like within a bunch of different other modes you can also have it as a four voice polyphonic um, MIDI to CV module and that means you get four voices that are in I guess round robin priority and you could turn it into the controller for a polyphonic modular setup not only that but you can also chain it together to uh, in essence make it into like an eight voice polyphonics MIDI module if you had two of these or if you had three of them you can have a 12 voice MIDI to CV voice but also it chains together as the mono um, MIDI channel so if you've got it on the default which which this one is default it's the uh, four channel um, MIDI to CV mode which is basically four CVs four velocities four gates clock out and then a bunch of CC commands if you chain it up to another one then it becomes an eight version of this so middle channel one to eight is then yeah so that's basically it it's quite in depth and you can get a very good grasp of its functions and there's even a graph of its functions over on the MIDI Muso site this actual module and the actual chip vary a little bit from the MIDI Muso it's got something called return to base and we'll look at that in a second but first let's uh, get it plugged in I'll plug it in first See, it has two MIDI throughs. I kind of, it doesn't make sense why things have less than two. The kind of idea would be you plug in one and you automatically add an extra kind of, uh, an extra output. It kind of multiplies the output. So if you keep on adding more, you end up getting loads more outputs. As you can see, it's already sending out a clock because the uh, actual circlon doesn't send a stop command. So if I press stop on the BeatStep Pro, it will stop, the clock will stop. You can see the flashing right there. This is basically just a signal of what is happening coming out of the MIDI. So you can see that there's actually just, uh, yeah, it just gives you an idea of there is actual signal going into from the MIDI stream. Because there's nothing more annoying than being like, is it is it working? Am I actually even getting any middle signal? So it's just a means of being able to problem solve on the go and kind of uh, be able to make the problem, figure out the problem is actually further in because you're actually getting light flashes from the uh, MIDI cable. I'm in the default mode, which is four channels. You've got uh, channel one. Channel two, channel three, and then channel four, which is nothing plugged into it. But it's actually the drums, but yeah. And as you can see, you get a little signal of what is being played with the gate. One of the big, 
One of the big differences with the MIDI Muso firmware in this and the MIDI Muso firmware that is available on MIDI Muso is it uses a mode called Return to Bass. And it's something that I wanted because it just plays a bit more like um, a classic monophonic synthesizer in mono mode. By Return to Bass, it means if you hit a low note and then you hit a high note and then you take your finger off the high note, this note still plays, it kind of re-triggers. But you can actually turn the re-trigger off so it acts more like an MS-10, so it goes you know but there's different modes and you can actually turn these modes on and off using the program changes which we'll chat about in a second but I'll just show you what I mean so you can see it plays perfectly fine uh, uh, right now I haven't got it plugged into a MIDI keyboard with a pitch bend but you could plug the pitch bend straight into here and then you get that coming out into uh, something like a CV input of an oscillator and then you use the CV attenuator to kind of judge the range of the pitch bend if you want it only a couple of notes or if you want it a whole octave or if you want it like two octaves I think it could go up the, I think the whole pitch bend range is five octaves in total on max. So if you want it to go like crazy, but in a five octaves, it ends up at, at 2.5 octaves, which is in the middle. And if you bring the pitch bend down, it goes to minus 2.5 octaves. And if you take the pitch bend up, it goes up to plus 2.5 octaves. You've also got extra voltages. If you assign these to different uh, parameters, you can send these in and you get, yeah, if, if you have something coming out on MIDI CC71, you can draw a little picture or something and make it do crazy modulation if you're on a computer I guess or something like that and then of course you have uh, velocities for all of these but annoyingly the keyboard that I have has no velocity nothing like that so uh, whatever the clock is here I think it's 48 steps per bar but also I'm working on another MIDI module that is more focused towards clocks and starts and stops but this is still there and you can use a clock divider to bring it down to a resolution you would uh, much prefer in order to change modes what you need to do is you need to download these little files tiny little files from the MIDI Muso site and pop them if you've got a computer for instance drag them onto logic for for each mode that you want and literally press play and um, have the actual um, MIDI to CV module plugged into the MIDI interface that you're using. Even if you have a USB keyboard like a like an M Audio, I don't know, controller or something, they actually act like, and they've got a MIDI output on them, that if you plug it into your computer and then plug this into the MIDI output on your USB controller, then it'll act like a MIDI interface and you're able to program the col the controls you want. However, I think the most useful one is the four voice mono one, which is what it is on default. So if that is what you're after, then you basically, you're sorted anyway. Alternatively, if you've got a sequencer like a circle on a, or an MPC or something, you send in program change 99, followed by the designated program change of the mode from the table uh, over on MIDI Muso. Anyway, this is a very brief look at it. Uh, without further ado, let's get one built. And yeah, if you're interested, then uh, go and check it out on the site. It's uh, got the MIDI Muso chip and it's got a couple of other chips as well. And yeah, it's just a simple uh, MIDI to CV module to make your Cosmo talk to everything else. Anyway, let's get building. Right, so this is what we actually are gonna need for the uh, for the backboard. This is the board that's got most of the electronics on it. Uh, it's the kind of brains behind the beast. And then the other PCB board that goes in between this and the panel is actually for uh, kind of like just talking to the outside world. So basically what I did with this is I started with the resistors. I basically, in this video, I actually put all of the resistors in and then soldered them after that. But it can prove being to be a little bit tricky because you kind of like circumnavigating your soldering iron around the uh, all of the resistor legs so maybe do them in chunks of 10 resistors one at a time if you haven't soldered before kind of just pop them in bend your leg and then yeah just just solder away to be honest if you've already built this one you've probably built a couple of the other cosmo projects so uh, you know you may be reasonably versed at the old soldery bow bouldery but i'm just you know mentioning it and then you go snip 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 and after snipping uh, I, look at me i'm being neat Look, I'm making a little pile. It's not all going on the floor. Oh, lovely. And then we go on to the capacitors after you've moved your camera, of course. So you put the capacitors in. These are just cer ceramic capacitors. These are the 10 nanofarads, I think. I can't see. I've got to zoom in. But basically, those are the uh, filters for the pulse width modulation. And then, yeah, you're popping in everything else. Uh, you may notice that those capacitors look a bit different to the others. It really doesn't make a difference. If yours all look the same, then it's perfectly fine. It's just uh, I only had 100 nanofarads 
Farad packages that look a bit funky like that. So if they all look like the 10 nano Farads, then you're still fine. As long as they're capac uh, capacitors, it doesn't really matter, you know. But shh, don't don't tell the don't tell the capacitor police. They'll be after you. <laughs> anyway, you just keep on snipping away. Now we put on all of the little bits, like the diode, with the uh, black wire of the diode going to the uh, white line on the silk screen of the diode, and the crystal. The crystal basically acts as a timing for the Atmega chip. It's sort of like an Arduino uh, with a load of circuits around it, in a way, if you want to think of it that way. For the MIDI Muso chip, which is an Atmega chip, uh, you need a 20N 28 pin IC socket, but you can get away with just using two of the 14 pin sockets that you used for the TLO74s, these ones. Same things, they just, there we go. Problem averted. So now after you've made sure that they are the right way round, this means that the semicircles on one side of the IC socket match up to the semicircles on the markings on the circuit board, the little white bits of silk screen. Uh, even if they're the wrong way round, it doesn't matter, just remember they're the wrong way round when you actually put the circuit board in. But I mean, not the circuit board, the IC chip, silly Sam. Anyway, hurry up Sam, we've got to get to the next bit. Now you use the electrolytic capacitors, these are all 10 microfarads, and make sure the white stripe matches up to the white bit on the marking. And then pop in the trim pots, these are for calibrations later on. Lovely jubbly. And then we put the Molex connectors in. I use blue tack to stick these down. I used to use super glue, but it's not as good because sometimes when you burn the super glue with your soldering iron, it kind of burns your eyes, it hurts. So if you don't need to check the voltages, but if you want to be doubly sure, then just check them because, you know, it sucks to pop one of these. I mean, you can buy another one from MIDI Muso for about £10, but, you know, you just, you don't, it's just something that you don't want to pop. So, after that, pop these in. Pop. pop a do pop 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 The 4504s, and then just carry on plopping them in. There's the uh, little hex inverter, and then here's the quad op amps that sit in there. One, two, three. Lovely jubbly. And there's the backboard done except for these, but we'll be using these later. Mmm, lovely jubbly. Now we're on to the next circuit board. This is what we need for the next circuit board. Here's the circuit board right here. And yeah, you've got to make sure that all of the bits are on the side where the markings are. So you plop the resistors on this side and then yeah, just all of these. There's quite a few of the same ones here, but it's it's not a quick job. It's not a long job. You just keep on going. Keep on trucking now, keep on trucking. Then after that, you pop in the capacitors. Same again, they might look different to the ones in the video. It doesn't really matter. It, re it really, really doesn't matter. I know there's like high five people are like, oh yes, there's a massive difference. But in, in this kind of realm right now, some places and some applications it does matter, but in this one, it does not. So ceramic are fine. They're just like common garden ceramic capacitors. And we snip them off. Snipper, snipper, snippity, 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 snippity. And then, uh, yeah, clean away. And then pop the uh, IC sockets on this side again, uh, making sure they're the right way round. Double check your soldering as you're going along. If something doesn't look quite right, then re solder again. And then admire your work. Ooh, lovely jublet. Now it's time to connect the two circuit boards together using these two IC headers. You can actually use like longer IC headers and snip them down. This is a little fiddly. It will take a little bit of patience to do it and then just solder a couple of legs down just to make sure it's all sitting right and sitting straight before you solder everything down because you don't want to pop it all solder one together and realize you soldered a wonky and then you, you you know it's just not an ideal situation you could have pro now it's time to put the sockets in uh, make sure they're on the other side of the uh, board to the resistors and now don't solder them in yet it's important you don't solder them in put the leds in the long leg goes to the plus sign on the silk screen now put the panel on it and uh yeah bolt them all in this is still 
not when they're soldered. They're not soldered yet. This means that you're able to make sure everything is perfectly lined up because if you do solder them in and they're slightly bent, you are basically, you might actually damage the circuit on the circuit board. Anyway, so now you just solder it all down. You may notice that I'm actually only soldering a couple of uh, points on the jack socket. You only actually need those two. The big square one's the ground and then the other one I'm soldering is the signal. Uh, but if you really want to go full hog, you can solder all of them. It really doesn't matter. It depends how lazy you are, uh, you know. Uh, in, in fact, in this video right there, I'm actually only soldering the ground pits, but I am going back and soldering the ones that are pretty much opposite uh, as well. Now we put in the standoffs. Arguably, you could have probably put these in earlier uh, because it is a little bit of a fiddle if you do it at this point. So maybe do this one earlier. Uh, these are just uh, standoffs to make sure that the bits uh, just don't fall to pieces. Now you pop in the mini sockets. They're just M3 bolts, just the same as usual. Hopefully the M3 bolts are just long enough. I found there are different brands of mini sockets that are slightly different lengths. So hopefully the 10, 10 millimeter M3 bolts, if not 50 15 millimeter M3 bolts just to be safe. But there we go. Now we solder on a couple of wires. As you notice, I'm soldering the blue to the top and then the pink to the bottom in this video. This will uh, prove uh, quite useful later on to realize which side we uh, solder and put the, uh, put the wires to on the Molex connectors. Now we just connect the two boards together again, screw in the M3 bolts. This just makes sure that it doesn't fall apart in heavy moving, you know, if you're touring or something and it falls to pieces. Now you put the two wires into the Molex connector. Make, make sure that the polarity, polarity is the same as in the video. And if it doesn't work, then maybe this is the first port of call to check and just swap the wires around. It's not gonna blow up if you wire these wrong first. Next, you plug it in and hopefully it doesn't go pop. And then it's time to do the calibration. It's very quick and easy, this. You can either do this just completely by ear or by hand by basically plugging something into it and playing like octaves on the CV and then twisting this until it's in tune. You could do that. And then the pitch bend one, you could keep on plugging in and plugging out the pitch bend knob until it doesn't affect it. But right now we can do the proper way, which, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter, you could do either way. You could literally just have it untuned, just, just mess around as you will, whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to, to anybody. So you find a ground, find a bit of ground to pop it in. Voltage, DC, and then we get, and then you can find that there's a test point. You need to adjust this one till it gives about 10.6 volts. This means it's gonna be nice and in tune and calibrated. So let's just work up here, 10.75, 10.61, that'll do. So there we go, 10.61, boom, that's in tune. Now, boom, that's in tune, I didn't realize that one. Now plug a jack into the pitch bend input and then uh, kind of get a reading from the end of that, like so, lay it down again. And this should read zero, so you need to twist this until you get zero volts, or as close to zero as, as, you, as you dare go. That'll do 0 0.3 millivolts. So that is now centered and the pitch bend when you plug it in is in the center. So now you have a calibrated uh, MIDI interface. Hopefully all the soldering was done correctly and yeah, fingers crossed it should work. Um, let's plug it in and see how it does its thingamajiggy. Before you plug it in, you can either solder these two pins together or you can make a little, uh, little connector thing. This basically means that it talks to it. These two are for when you want to chain two of these together because they handshake together and it means you can have up to 12 note polyphony or you can have MIDI channels one to eight or even if you have three of them you can have MIDI channels one to one to 12 and if you have four of them chained together with these two chain inputs and outputs you can control all 16 MIDI channels one to 16 with four of these. So that's just a quick one but if you only have one make sure you have this channel input uh, kind of daisy chained together. 